Thank you, Jason. That was awesome. So next, um, Andy will talk to us about uh, pulmonary embolism in pregnancy. Um, I don't think I need to say introduce her. Uh, she's a very dear friend of mine for a long time, and um, she's a professor at Duke. And um, currently, I mean, she's the founding president of the foundation, and currently serves at the board of directors. So, um, pleasure to see you again, Andy. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. This warms my heart more than you can possibly imagine. Uh, I'm going to finish the trilogy here on conditions in the labor and delivery suite where we call the hematologist. Usually we in OB, we manage it up to a point, and then when things get bad, we call the hematologist. And then after the break, we'll uh, talk about fetal and neonatal conditions where we call the pediatric hematologist. But this finishes the trilogy of when we call the hematologist uh, to the labor and delivery suite. You may have seen in uh, Dr. Berwick's talk, he talked about the portion of preeclampsia that results in HELP syndrome or uh, very severe phenotype and it's less than 1%. So we'll manage all the, we'll manage it all the time and then when, it, when things are going down the drain, then we will call you. So, and this is the, like I said, the third in the trilogy here. Uh, I have honoraria from Cirrus, which is not relevant to this talk. And this talk will cover uh, life-threatening venous thromboembolic events, particularly pulmonary embolism during pregnancy, goals of treatment, the role of vena cava filters, the range of treatments from anticoagulation to thrombolysis, thrombectomy, and ECMO. We'll start with some background. I'm not going to talk about arterial thromboembolism, although life-threatening as well. Um, most arterial thromboembolism in pregnancy is related to stroke, uh, some related to myocardial infarction, almost no peripheral arterial disease. 80% of thromboembolic conditions in pregnancy are venous thromboembolic conditions, and that is true of this age range in general, that 80% of clots are thromboses in uh, this age range are venous thromboembolic events. And among those venous thromboembolic events, uh, 75 to 80 percent are DVT, uh, 12 percent uh, originate in the pelvis, or 75 to 90 percent originate in the left lower extremity. When venous thromboembolic events occur in the setting of estrogen, Hormonal contraceptives or pregnancy, these tend to be big iliofemoral events, and they tend to occur on the left, perhaps related to the relationship of the uh, uh, circulation there on the arterial side, compressing the venous side. 12% in the pelvis, 2% in the upper extremity, and less than 1% in rare sites. But the interesting thing about the rare sites is that they uh, may be overlooked not suspected uh, as a reason for a patient's symptomatology. Uh, Life-threatening consequences of VTE at rare sites include in splanchnic vein thromboses if they develop irreversible thrombosis in splanchnic vein, meaning hepatic vein thromboses, which may have the consequence of ascites, hepatic insufficiency or bleeding, portal vein thromboses with the consequences of portal hypertension, mesenteric venous obstruction and intestinal infarction, mesenteric vein thrombosis, which may result in bowel ischemia, intestinal infarction, peritonitis, GI bleeding. And we had a patient who uh, had a chronic mesenteric vein thrombosis, this was years ago, that she had wound up with laparoscopy, and she ultimately got referred to psychiatry for chronic pain before she got a bowel infarct and then got the correct diagnosis. Uh, splenic vein uh, thrombosis 
can result in GI bleeding, and cerebral vein thrombosis uh, can result in stroke. So uh, 20 to 25 percent of venous thromboembolism in pregnancy embolizes, and pulmonary embolism is life-threatening. The uh, life-threatening consequences are that one results in one maternal death in every 100,000 deliveries. Uh, two to a half percent of these women die for every 100,000 uh, live births. Uh, Three percent of survivors will develop chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And goals of treatment include uh, clot prevention, uh, hasten thrombus resorption, achieving recanalization of the clot and the affected vessel, avoiding post-thrombotic syndrome, avoiding the life-threatening consequences of venous thromboembolism at rare sites, preventing thrombo uh, venous, uh, excuse me, pulmonary embolism or minimizing its consequences and avoiding chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Now, uh, anti-thrombotic therapy is effective. And we have data in pregnancy, too, that it reduces the risk of clot propagation, life or limb-threatening clots, uh, life-threatening consequences at rare sites, and pulmonary embolism. Uh, and how do we treat it? We have good consensus uh, from most recently our American Society of Hematology guidelines for thromboembolism in the context of pregnancy. Uh, they include antithrombotic therapy for at least six months. Many providers will continue throughout the duration of the pregnancy and for at least six weeks to up to three months postpartum. Low molecular weight heparin as opposed to unfractionated heparin. Oral anticoagulants cross the placenta and cross into breast milk, so we don't use them unless except in the postpartum woman who is not breastfeeding. Uh, twice a day or once a day dosing of low molecular weight heparin. <coughs> uh, Clinical data don't support twice daily dosing over once daily dosing, but pharmacokinetic studies do support twice daily dosing over once daily dosing. Inpatient, or excuse me, initial outpatient therapy is the, if the patient is low risk. Dr. Moiss and I were just talking about this at the table. So uh, there, in the studies where they randomized patients to initial outpatient treatment of pulmonary embolism versus inpatient treatment only looked at low-risk patients and pregnancy was considered an exclusion. So we don't have data that uh, initial outpatient therapy is safe in pregnancy. And often these clots are big iliofemoral clots and maybe in a patient who has a calf vein thromboembolism at eight weeks gestation, perhaps. But generally, the, our patients have big clots. We don't know where they're going. Uh, there is an unknown benefit of serial anti-10A monitoring. Many people do it at least a couple times, maybe once a trimester, maybe once a month. No good uh, data to support doing it or not doing it. And in DVT, there is no benefit of routine catheter-directed thrombolysis therapy, and there is the risk of harm. And, what are, and for those of you who may not be familiar with catheter-directed thrombolysis, it may or may not in, reduce the incidence of post-thrombotic syndrome. It may increase the risk of recurrent venous thromboembolism. It does increase the risk of bleeding. It exposes the fetus to radiation. but. Uh, it is indicated for life or limb threatening DVT. And I alluded to uh, postpartum lactation. Low molecular weight heparin does not cross into uh, breast milk in any significant amount. And furthermore, it's not an orally bioavailable medication. So we have complete confidence we can give low molecular weight safely during lactation. Vitamin K antagonists 
for instance, warfarin, uh, does not cross into the breast milk in any significant amount. This is counterintuitive in that it does cross the placenta and it is a teratogen, but in breastfeeding, warfarin is considered safe. Uh, and in neonatal studies, it has not been shown to anticoagulate neonates. Uh, the direct oral anticoagulants, particularly rivaroxaban and apixaban, which are used widely in the United States, do not cross into breast milk and are uh, not considered, or excuse me, do cross into breast milk as far as we know and are not considered safe. What are our treatment options? Uh, well, uh, maybe you've wondered what is the evidence for anticoagulation treatment in pulmonary embolism? Well, there was a randomized controlled trial uh, back in uh, 1960, which doesn't seem all that uh, long ago that this was published. They uh, randomized uh, 35 patients to treatment or no treatment with heparin. This was novel uh, to treat pulmonary embolism. And in, there were 19 patients in the untreated group and 15 in the treated or existing in the treated group. There were five deaths in the untreated group. Five had recurrences, and compared to the uh, treated group, there was only one uh, death from another cause. So I'll uh, read you this quote from the paper. By April 1958, 35 patients had been included, and at this stage it became necessary to review the further conduct of the trial. <laughs> so our initial treatment of acute pregnancy-related pulmonary embolism parallels that of DVT, uh, initial therapy uh, with low molecular weight heparin or intravenous unfractionated heparin, continuation with low molecular weight heparin, and otherwise it's the same as for DVT, including postpartum. Now what's the mortality data for treatment of pulmonary embolism? And this is population data. This is not specific to pregnancy. Uh, for non-severe, the risk is less than 1%. For severe, for submassive, 25%. For massive, 25 to 65%. And how do we distinguish them from each other? A massive pulmonary embolism is where there's hemodynamic compromise with either systolic blood pressure less than 90 or a drop in systolic blood pressure greater than 40 millimeters of mercury or the need for ionotropic support or cardiac arrest, which is bad. Uh, Submassive, uh, there is no hemodynamic compromise, but there is evidence of right heart strain. So uh, what are the data for systemic thrombolytic therapy? When would we consider that? Uh, in the meta-analysis of RCTs in non-pregnant individuals, Systemic thrombolytic therapy was associated with reduced mortality in massive and submassive PE, but with increased risk of bleeding, uh, a threefold odds of intracranial hemorrhage. So proceed with caution. And in a summary of 14 published cases of systemic thrombolytic therapy in pregnancy, there were no maternal deaths or fetal or neonatal deaths directly attributed to the therapy, but there were five major and three minor bleeds. This is a nice review that was published in the Journal of Thrombosis and Hemostasis of 125, or 127 cases of uh, severe PE in pregnancy. And they looked, this is observational data, but, but a good number of cases where they looked at the outcomes uh, by treatment. And in the anticoagulation group alone, of which there were four, the sur survival was 75%, and that was compared to a 94% survival in 83 patients who received systemic thrombolysis. So small numbers looks like maybe better in severe pulmonary uh, embolism. And then what about some of the other alternatives uh, uh, for aggressive therapy in this situation? Uh, percutaneous thrombectomy, there were seven patients and 100% survived. In surgical thrombectomy, there were 80, there were uh, 36 patients and 86 survived. And in ECMO, there were three patients and 100% survived. 
so percutaneous thrombectomy is what it sounds like. Uh, there, it's another catheter-directed therapy into the pulmonary artery. And what about surgical thrombectomy? Well, this involves a sternotomy, cardiopulmonary bypass, and high-dose heparin. This is not available at a home birth. The, uh, <clears throat> so for those of you who know my origins, I started my career as a nurse midwife. I trained at Hopkins, uh, and I gravitated to the place where we had everything available. Uh, this clot on the far right, this 20 centimeter clot, was pulled out of a pulmonary artery of a patient at Duke. Uh, she was a patient who had uh, Sjogren's sy syndrome. She had a stillbirth. She was undergoing induction. She had a ruptured uterus. Uh, she had an, an emergency hysterotomy. Uh, she collapsed on the, she had respiratory arrest during the C-section. She was taken to cardiothoracic surgery. Uh, and she survived and survived well. But it required a sternotomy, cardiopulmonary bypass, and high dose heparin. And then I don't think that we have used ECMO in a case of pulmonary embolism, but we can bypass the thromboembolism completely. I'll look at Jason and Michael and Ken and Louise, if you had a patient who used ECMO in pulmonary embolism. Maybe we can talk about that during the discussion. Access to ECMO, however, is limited. This is a map from uh, uh, now seven years ago. There are more centers that have ECMO available, but it's not, certainly not available at every institution. It tends to be limited to large academic centers. And then I'm going to finish um, by talking about a treatment consideration, and that is a question I get frequently. Uh, it's about vena cava filters. And before I talk about that, I'll talk about, well, where is the greatest risk of bleeding in pregnancy? Well, it parallels the risk of thrombosis and the risk of uh, evolutionarily women have evolved so that they are protected from bleeding risk during pregnancy and the risk of clotting, which parallels the risk of bleeding, begins even in the first trimester. But the greatest risk is around the time of delivery and immediately postpartum when the risk is uh, five times what it is in the rest of the pregnancy and 20 to 80 times what it is uh, outside of pregnancy. So in the anticipating delivery, our, we have to anticipate uh, the risk of bleeding, and do we want the patient who is on anticoagulation uh, to be continued on anticoagulation at the time of delivery? Probably not. And what are our alternatives? Well, uh, then the question is, well, what about placing a vena cava filter? Uh, the, there are risks, as you're aware, with a vena cava filter. Uh, they may be even more so in pregnancy because of the location of the uterus and the pliability of the blood vessels. But nonetheless, we might consider this if, the, if an acute event, uh, DVT occurred within two to four weeks uh, before delivery or the need for major surgery. So with that, I will just thank you very much for being here. Thank you for calling. Thank you for coming when we call you. Thank you for your consults on labor and delivery. We are most grateful. Uh, Luis, question. 